will be discussing about eczema gland in brief effects of corticosteroids on the body and clinical features of Cushing syndrome, differential diagnosis, investigation and treatment. Coming to the adrenal gland, this is the section for the adrenal gland showing both medulla and cortex. Cortex contains three glands, zona glomerosa, fasciculata, and medullaris. Basically, this basically you all know. Uh, Insulin is released by glomerulosa, cortisol by fasciculata, and medullaris releasing androgens. Medulla is wholly responsible for epinephrine and norepinephrine. So this is basically a basic adrenal steroidogenesis flowchart. Thing is, uh, you guys must know all the enzymes playing role in the steroidogenesis. Three beta has a few deoxygenases. Uh, basically, this enzyme. 11 beta hydroxylase has a role to play in medical management of Cushing syndrome. There is a medicine which we will be discussing ahead targeting this enzyme, 11 beta hydroxylase, so as to minimize the release of glucocorticoids. Basically, it acts over here. Cholesterol is the precursor of all the aldosterone, cortisol, and 5 diadose testosterone. And our therapy targets over this enzyme 11 beta hydroxylase. This is basically the biochemistry you all know regarding the flow chart of the adrenal steroidogenesis. We will be discussing and targeting specifically over this because the medical management targets were there which inhibit the production of cortisol and further cortisol. This is the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. Basically, the circadian rhythm or the stresses, which include physical stress, emotional stress, and even fever or hypoglycemia or hypotension, which stimulates our hypothalamus, which releases cortical tropomelizing hormone, which acts on anterior pituitary, causing further release of Adrenocorticotropic hormone ACTH, which acts on adrenal gland and causes the release of cortisol. Basically, it is a response, normal response, also and also response to stress. Whenever there is an excess release of cortisol and increase in the free level of cortisol in our body, which need, basically leads to the basic pathology of Cushing syndrome, increase in circulating level of cortisol, which can either be due to increased production of incidents or the gland can be responsible for that. Either there is an anomaly in gland which causes the increased amount of release of cortisol or there are too much of stressor causing stimulating and pituitary causing increase in incidents or they can be apart from this axis there can be a topic release of ACTH, which we'll be discussing. Release of ACTH, which acts on adrenal gland and causes increase in cortisol level. Then uh, the topic release of ACTH in the hypothalamus and pituitary glands are normal. They are not causing the increased amount of ACTH. This HD axis will be very helpful in when we'll be studying the approach or approach to diagnose a case of Cushion syndrome. This is the, these are the principal sites of action of Google corticoids in human being. Beginning from brain to each and every part of our body, steroids can cause psychosis as well as depression and can also cause suppress the release of LH, TSH, growth hormones, and I would think of glucoma, all these carbohydrate lipid metabolism, even in the GI tract, peptic ulceration, in the cardiovascular, renal, salt water retention and hypertension, adipose tissue distribution, usually it promotes visceral obesity, 
in bones, osteoporosis, decreased inflammation. We will be discussing these in detail. Metabolism. Fluoroidic stimulate adipocyte differentiation, promoting adipogenesis through transcriptional activity of key differential genes, increasing lipoprotein lipase, and all these in veins. Long term effects of mucoticoid excess on adipose tissue is very complex and it causes basically deposition of visceral or central adipose tissue. Which is wholly really responsible for uh, a typical presentation of Cushion syndrome, uh, syndrome that is central obesity. When, when you see a patient of Cushion syndrome, you'll see there is a centripetal obesity. Not all bodies, not only these, only the central part of the body is obese. Because uh, basically, central adipose tissue is stimulated due to the glucocorticoid excess. And into the bone and calcium metabolism, glucocorticoid inhibit osteoblast function, which causes further new osteoporosis. Osteonecrosis, also termed as irrational necrosis, very important manifestation of abuse of steroids, irrational use of steroids in the patients can cause to osteonecrosis. It is a very common finding in children as well as in adults. Most common size is, size is for whole head. Patient will complain of pain and will not be able to know what is the cause. It can also affect at any age. And even with very relatively low doses of mucoticoids. Starting of uh, COVID, steroids have been abused irrationally, it has been used. That's a typical guideline was given by AIMS for not using of steroids in the mild cases. It was basically abused, steroid was abused, and people are now coming to the OPD with the adverse effects caused by the steroids. These are very helpful drug, but can also call, cause very much damage in a, in a even low doses. So we have to be very specific in, while using the steroids. We should have proper indication and rational before starting the steroids in any patient. Basically, this is the image showing the bone abnormalities called the in cushion disease, aseptic necrosis in the right femoral head or the right femoral head in MHP, and diffuse osteoporosis in the vertebral collapse. Now, coming to the very important manifestation of salt water homeostasis and blood pressure control. Neurocorticoids increase blood pressure by a variety of mechanisms. Muscle smooth muscle will increase sensitivity to pressure agents such as catecholamines and angiotensin 2 while reducing nitric oxide mediated dilatation, endothelial dilatation. In kidney, uh, 11 beta hydroxy steroid dehydrogenase, depending on its activity, potential can act on distal nephron to cause sodium retention and potassium loss. By mineralocorticoid receptor. Basically, this is a very important thing to be used. Usually, in uh, resistant hypertension, when we ever suspect adrenal crisis, whenever there is loss or less levels of circulating steroids, get, uh, cortisol, we administer steroids so as to increase the blood pressure despite giving all vessel pressure support. Patient BP does not come to the mean, BP does not arise. Then steroid plays a role in increasing the blood pressure. But conversely, whenever it is abused, the patient presents you with hypertension. So it has also use and abuse 
valuable steroid causing hypertension. Major use of steroid in COVID was because of this action only, anti-inflammatory action. Because guys, medication were not as effective as steroids. It plays a major anti-inflammatory role in our body. Definitely, blood glucocorticoid reduces lymphocyte counts acutely by redistributing lymphocytes from intervascular compartment from lymph nodes and bone marrow. And also, conversely, neutrophil count increases after glucocorticoid administration. Inhibition of cytokine production from lymphocytes is mediated through inhibition of action of natural factor capability. They play the crucial and generalized role in including cytokine gene transcription. Glucocorticoids can bind directly and prevent nuclear translocation. Basically, this is the action steroids are used in COVID. They act as anti-inflammatory agents. Also, whenever the steroids are being administered, mild level of leukocytosis is also seen in CBC of the patients. We can generally avoid that and can falsely interpret as uh, part of sepsis when there is, when there is leukocytosis, but on its way, average up to more than I mean, up to 15,000 of PLC, whenever we are using steroid in a patient, it is just because of uh, adverse effect of steroid. It is not because of secondary bacterial infection that there is leukocytosis. So we have to be very careful when initiating antibiotics also because uh, it can be a false high reading of uh, DNC because of steroids. Effect of steroid in CNS and mood. Guru body called neuronal death, notably in hippocampus. Also, also, a very exciting feature. I will be coming in five minutes. Wait. Sorry for the interruption. Uh, yes. Patients are coming post COVID uh, with complaints of loss of memory, or there has been a notable feature which can be because of irrational and excessive use of glucocorticoids. Primarily because it causes neuronal death in hippocampus. It is a very striking feature commonly encountered these days post COVID illness. Apart from COVID, it usually affects hippocampus, causing cognitive dysfunction, loss of memory, and neurodegenerative disorders like Alzheimer's. Also, also patient encounters euphoria after initiation of steroids or depression or psychosis. We have the very common manifestation of steroid administration to the patients. Talking about eye, in the eye, glucocorticoids add to this to the intraocular pressure to an increase in aqueous tumor production. And deposition of matrix within the transverse network, which inhibits the aqueous drainage. Ultimately, using leading to glaucoma, it is a very important role in eye also. Whenever, whenever patient comes with uh, symptoms of question, whenever it is quite evident to you, 
patient can complain of headache you should also always always suspect for glaucoma and also always get an ophthalmology reference for the consultation for the same glaucoma it is a very common manifestation glaucoma talking about manifestation on drug steroids increase the risk for peptic ulcer disease and also long term administration of steroids leads to peptic ulcer that why that we always always prescribe ppi while administering oral steroid or iv steroid to the patient never ever miss a ppi while administering steroids other manifestation is pancreatitis with fat necrosis also the glucocorticoid receptor are expressed throughout the gi tract and the glucocorticoid receptor are expressed only in the distal colon so excess of glucocorticoid can cause damage to any tract any part of the gi tract talking about the endocrine effects glucocorticoid suppresses the thyroid axis probably to the direct action of the secretion of tsh in addition they also inhibit five dd main activities that mediate the conversion of thyroxine to active th triad t3 uh, this is triad thyroxine glucocorticoid also acts simply to inhibit bovine protein release in colon and also the release of lh and fsh Now talking about the therapeutic use of corticosteroids in endocrine, most commonly used in Addison disease, pituitary disease, and Graves or hepatitis. Dermatologists very commonly use steroids either topically or orally. In hematology. It is used in leukemia, lymphoma, fibrinolytic anemia. In GI tract, inflammatory bowel disease. Inflammatory bowel disease. Most commonly used drug is budesonide. Budesonide these days are uh, there is very 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 minimal absorption and budesonide sustained release tablets come which. Act only in terminal EM or the colon. Terminal EM basically, and which is specifically targeted for Crohn's or uh, the Budesonide sustenance tablets, which acts only in EM and there is minimal systemic absorption, causing the uh, um, basically minimalizing the adverse effects caused by systemic absorption of the steroid. In liver, basically after liver transplantation or after any adverse effect after transplantation or the injection, steroids are being used. In renal, most commonly used in nephrotic syndrome, as you all know, uh, steroids is the mainstay treatment of nephrotic syndrome, save for transplantation or injection. In CNS, cerebral edema, raising the renal pressure, also also in Tuberculosis meningitis or bacterial meningitis. We have to have to start steroid first before initiating any antibiotic therapy or anti-tuberculosis treatment, so as to reduce the inflammation first. In respiratory system, respiratory disorder, pulmonologist mainstay treatment is steroid, either oral, inhaler, or IV. COPD patients are being given these steroids for either in steroid or inhalation form or oral form whenever not controlled or any acute exacerbation. Also, neurological disorders like SME, temporal arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, or in myopathies or myasthenia gravis or polymyalgia rheumatica. These are the therapeutic use of corticosteroids directed for the diseases. Now coming to the topic, 
Question three will. In 1912, have a question for the child of 22 year old female with her citizen in Korea. Uh, as it keeps, he postulated that it is a polyglandular syndrome, which is due to primarily due to pituitary abnormality. Basically, he postulated that, but later on it was found it is not only pituitary, it can be adrenal or outside the coagulus HV axis. So, two terms are being used now these days question syndrome and question disease. A very important difference which everyone must know. Syndrome is used to describe all the causes, whereas question disease is reserved for pituitary dependent question syndrome. This is the these are the causes of Cushing syndrome. ACT is dependent and ACT is independent. So as we discussed in HP excess, if it is ACT is independent, so we'll be only talking about adrenal causes. Not the adrenal particular adenoma, carcinoma, or the polyglandular things like mercurial albright syndrome or Hyperbaria of macromodular animal hyperbaria. When talking about ACT dependent cushions, cushion disease is the most common common manifestation. Cushion disease is ACT is producing pituitary edema. So, whenever we talk about cushion disease, it, should, it is specified that it is a pituitary edema we are talking about. And apart from pituitary disease disorders, Ectopic cells of ACTH are also part of ACTH dependent cushions. It can be because of ectopic release of uh, secretion of ACTH by bronchial or pancreatic carcinoma tumors, or small lung cancer, medullary thyroid carcinoma, or phlebocytoma. Whenever a patient comes to you with typical symptoms, which we'll be discussing afterwards of Cushing's, always, always suspect for these tumors or cancers. We should not miss any of these, thinking it to be a pituitary adenoma. This is basically a difference pushing, uh, between Cushing disease and Cushing syndrome. Discovered by tumor on pituitary gland that causes the gland to produce too much ACTH. ACTH is responsible for production of cortisol. As a result, too much of ACTH then causes the adrenal gland to produce too much cortisol hormone. We are talking about Cushing syndrome. Due to causes outside the body that increase the levels of cortisol, such as taking medication. This is the difference between Cushing disease and Cushing syndrome. We can go through it. Cancer is never a cause of Cushing disease. Now, coming to the signs and symptoms of Cushing syndrome. Talking about the body system involved, the body fat, there is a weight gain, central obesity, rounded face, fat pad deposition on the back of the neck, most commonly termed as buffalo hump. Talking about the skin, there is a facial plethora, thin and brittle skin is there. You see there is easy bruising. Patient will complain of easy bruising over the skin. Broad and purple stretch marks over the abdomen. Acne will be very common. Hacidism is also common manifestation. Talking about the skeletal system, bone, uh, osteopenia, osteoporosis. In children, 
there is suppression of growth hormone, so there will be a decreased unit of growth in children. Talking about muscle weakness, proximal myopathy, a very, very common differential diagnosis for proximal myopathy, a patient of Cushing syndrome can also present as can present to you with complaining of proximal myopathy, isolated. Patient will complain that he you know, she is unable to get up from the squatting position. He is not able to pick uh, objects overhead. Causing myopathy, proximal muscle weakness in both shoulder girdle and, and hip girdle. In cardiovascular system, due to retention of sodium, patient can present to as with hypertension and increase in potassium loss lead to hypokalemia metabolism increased level of cortisol will lead to diabetes as now being commonly seen patients have developed diabetes or uncontrolled hyperglycemia level post covid due to the administration of steroids to the patient who are not diabetic have developed diabetes or those who are primarily diabetic have developed poor control, poor glycemic control. On the reproductive system, there is decreased libido, amenorrhea, uh, MCNS as discussed, there is emotional liability, depression, some cognitive defects. Neuronal death in hippocampus can lead to memory dysfunction and cognitive disorders. On blood and immune system, increased susceptibility to infection, leucopenia, increase in TLC, hypercognition disorders. These are the images showing you the clinical features of the Cushing syndrome. Centripetal obesity, purple style marks, easy bruising. This is the typical bruising you can see. These are the purple stretch marks, styles. This is a typical moon face. With plethora. These are other clinical features of Cushing syndrome. This is a note showing me the symptoms already discussed. These are the symptoms sign and how much common are these. Now coming to the differential diagnosis. A patient presenting to you with these images or uh, clinical features. We have to think of other differential diagnoses also. Alcoholic patients also have hypercortisolism and can clinically manifest as Cushing syndrome. Pregnant women, critically ill patients, depressed patients. and patient with severe obesity. These are the common differential diagnosis of Cushing syndrome patient. Now coming to the test, there are usual diagnosis and differential diagnosis of Cushing syndrome. We should have a approach, does the patient have Cushing syndrome? 
And if yes, what is the cause of cushion syndrome? First, we have to rule out the cushion syndrome. I think uh, patient is actually a, a part of cushion syndrome or not. If he is, yes, then what can be the cause of cushion syndrome? We will discuss these tests in detail and the approach to a patient of cushion syndrome. The circadian level of plasma cortisol in a normal subject, plasma cortisol level are at the highest early in the morning and at uh, midnight, about midnight, the region is there. But in a patient of cushion syndrome, 9 a.m. plasma cortisol level is normal, but nocturnal levels are raised. This is the striking difference between the uh, circadian rhythm and a patient with cushion syndrome. Whereas in normal patient, 9 a.m. plasma cortisol level will be the highest. And oppositely, uh, a patient of cushion syndrome, 9 a.m. plasma cortisol level will be normal, but the uh, midnight level will be raised. Random morning plasma cortisol level are the uh, for often very little value, so we should count, count, uh, measure the midnight cortisol level. And the value more than 7.5 microgram per deciliters are definitive of cushion syndrome. Now we will talk about the test, Yoda's uh, overnight dexamethasone suppression test. On patient test. Firstly, I'll show you the flow chart, then we come back to it. So basically, this is the approach. Whenever you are suspecting a cushion syndrome patient, always, always firstly exclude exogenous low body blood exposure. Ask the patient whether he or she is taking uh, any steroidal medication, and if yes, then the call is due to the exogenous ingestion of new radicals. Then we don't need to get over these tests, but if he or she refuses, then we have to perform either 24 hour urine free cortisol level or overnight 1 milligram dexamethasone suppression test or late night salivary cortisol test. Either of the tests is abnormal. Then we have to further go, then I'll discuss in detail. We will do overnight dexamethasone suppression test. Very important test. Can be used in, uh, as an outpatient screening test in which 1 milligram of dexamethasone is given at 11 pm. A normal response is a plasma partition level of less than 1.8 microgram per deciliter, uh, deciliter between 8 to 9 a.m. in the following morning. It is a normal response. In the uh, 48 hour low dose dexamethasone test, a plasma cortisol is measured at 9 a.m. on day 0. And again, 48 hours later, after administration of dexamethasone 0.5 mg every 6 hours for 48 hours. We have to give uh, 0.5 mg of dexamethasone at every 6 hour interval for 48 hours, for 2 days. Then we have to check uh, the cortisol level at 9 a.m. after 48 hours. Using a post dexamethasone plasma cortisol concentration of less than 1.8 microgram per deciliter as a cutoff point. It has a 97 to 100 percent true positive rate and a false positive rate less than 1%, a cortisol level greater than 1.8 after administration of 1 mg dexamethasone is considered to be positive. Whereas the normal response is less than 1.8 and the, there is increased value more than 1.8, it is considered to be positive. Talking about salivary cortisol test, the cutoff points that define disease vary depending on the assay used. 
In one of the studies, cortisol value of greater than 2 nanogram per milliliter had 100% sensitivity and 96% specificity for the diagnosis of Cushing syndrome. It is important to note that late night salivary cortisol tends to increase with age and cardiovascular comorbid conditions such as hypertension and diabetes. Thus, the discriminating power diminishes in the elderly population. So, it is not a very, very reliable test because of the bias factors. But this is the value uh, late night salivary cortisol concentration greater than 4 mole mm per liter is the cutoff for uh, Cushing syndrome. And again, another test urinary free cortisol excretion. Sensitivity and specificity are very poor. But uh, depending on the assays, normal range are different for different labs. So, urinary free cortisol value greater than the normal range given is considered to be positive. So, we have to perform one of the following tests. We always, always prefer dexamethasone suppression test considering its specificity and the sensitivity. If it is normal, then highly, highly unlikely that it is a Cushing syndrome. We have to look for the other differential as discussed. And if any abnormal result, exclude physiological cause of hypercortisolism, then we have to perform another one or two other studies, same studies. Then we have to, only first we have to perform these screening tests, then we have to perform the high dose or uh, dexamethasone suppression test that is 48 hours one. At every six hourly group and five MP of uh, dexamethasone is given to the patient. So as to be sure, once that test is also normal, then we are sure that patient is having Cushing syndrome. Uh, these are the other tests for the next step. Uh, after we are confirmed about the diagnosis Cushing syndrome. So once Cushing syndrome is clinically or biochemically confirmed, we have to now diagnose whether it is ACTH dependent or ACTH independent. So we have to see the levels of ACTH in the body. If ACTH levels are suppressed, so that means adrenal are the cause. That is, increase in cortisol level are suppressing ACTH. There is uh, overproduction in adrenal gland due to either carcinoma or adenoma, adrenal adenomas, which are causing increase in the circulating level of cortisol, which as per H3 is suppressing the ACTH. If the ACTH levels are suppressed, then the cause is in adrenal gland. And if it is detectable, ACTH is detectable, then the cause is ACTH dependent that we have discussed, that is Cushing disease or ectopic ACTH production. Following which, we have to go for a high dose dexamethasone suppression test or CRH stimulation test or a MRI for the children. That I will discuss this test. Now, talking about corticoprotein releasing hormone test. The test involves the intravenous injection of either wine or human sequence of CRH of dose 1 microgram per kg body weight or maximum dose of 100 micrograms. This test can be performed in the morning or afternoon. After basal sampling, CRH is uh, basal sampling for ACTH and steroids, uh, cortisol level, we, are, we inject CRH and blood samples for ACTH and cortisol are then taken every 15 minutes to 1 to 2 hours. In normal subjects, CRH or uh, cortisol according to a total reason women, produces a rise in ACTH and cortisol of 15 to 20 percent. 
if response is exaggerated in question degrees, in which typically an ACTH increase is greater than 50% and a cortisol rise is greater than 20% over baseline values. As we discussed, we prefer injecting uh, CRS to the patient who will take the basal sample of ACTH and cortisol. So after injecting uh, CRH, then we see the change in the levels of ACTH and cortisol. If there is a rise of about uh, 15 to 20 percent, it is considered to be as a normal response of a human body to CRH. CRH further stimulates ACTH in the body, which usually rises to 15 to 20 percent. And same goes for cortisol. But if there is more than 50% rise in the values of ACTH from the baseline and cortisol value is more than 20%, it is considered positive. Test is considered as positive for questions, ACT dependent causes. Now, talking about another test, high dose dexamethasone suppression test. The rationale for the high dose dexamethasone suppression test is that in cushion disease, the negative feedback control of ACTH is reset to a higher level than normal. Since uh, there is uh, increase in already level of due to pituitary adenoma, there is already increase in level of ACTH. So a low dose dexamethasone suppression test will not be effective or it will not be able to suppress the ACTH levels through a normal HV axis as there is already increase in level of ACTH. So we have to increase the dose of dexamethasone. So a railway test was introduced by Liddell, was based on giving 2 mg of dexamethasone every 6 hours for 48 hours and demonstrating a fall of greater than 50% in urinary 17 hydroxycorticosteroids. In low dose, we use 0.5 mg and then higher dose we use 2 mg dexamethasone every 6 hour. Basic difference and we have to analyze it by uh, uh, demonstrating that there is a fall of fall more than 50% in urinary 17 hydroxycorticosteroids. But these days, plasma urinary free cortisol is measured at 0 and 48 hours and a greater than 50% suppression of uh, plasma cortisol from the basal values has been used to define a positive response. Earlier, urinary level was seen, but nowadays, plasma cortisol level are compared from baseline and after 48 hours, after given high doses, dexamethasone. The new dose dexamethasone suppression test has been used in the diagnosis of Cushing syndrome and a greater than 50% fall in cortisol is observed, there is no added value in the high dose dexamethasone suppression test. If it is proven by low dose, high dose is not required. Now another important test, uh, inferior petrosal sinus sampling and selective venous sensitization. In mostly all patients with ectopic ACTH syndrome, the ratio of uh, ACTH concentration in inferior petrosal sinus and that in simultaneously drawn peripheral venous blood is less than 1.4 to 1. But in a case of Cushing disease, uh, the ratio is elevated to greater than 2. However, because of intermittent ACTH secretion, it is useful to take the measurements before and at intervals of 2, 5, and 15 minutes. After the intravenous injection of 100 microgram CRH. Using this approach, an ACTH petrosal sinus peripheral ratio greater than 3 after CRH administration has a sensitivity of 95% and specificity of nearly 100% for diagnosing Cushing disease. So this is a flow chart basically on uh, those tests we have discussed. If a suspected patient syndrome, 
Now we have to rule out whether it is OCT dependent or independent. If OCT levels are suppressed, then it is because of adrenal cause. We have to consider the CT scan of adrenal glands. If ACT is detectable, then we have to think about ACT dependent disease. Those other tests we have uh, discussed, that is 50% cortisol suppression after high dose dexamethasone, a 50% increase in serum cortisol per CRS stimulation test. If, it is, if these tests are positive, then the diagnosis is cushion disease. Then we have to proceed for transthenoidal hypo. Is it new? And if these tests are not conclusive, then we have to go for the test inferior petrosal sinus sampling. If this test is also negative, then we have to look for the ectopic causes of ACTH production. Uh, particularly, MRI is the investigation of choice forms. Biometric tests have suggested, uh, suggested pushing disease. About 90% of ACT secretion pituitary tumors are microadenomas. The classical features of pituitary microadenoma are, high, are hypo intense lesion on a T1 weighted images after the contrast announcement which may be associated with deviation of pituitary stock and a convex upper surface of the pituitary gland. This is a typical finding on a pituitary MRI for a microadenoma, hyperintense lesion on T1, which is definitely for cushion disease. Now, talking about the treatment, once the cushion disease is confirmed, if the tumor resection is possible, resect it. Uh, also, if resection is not possible or if there is a failed surgery, the approach was not right, we cannot resect the tumor or there is a recurrence, then we have to go with the medical management and other things like how to control hypocortisolism. We have to consider for repeat surgery if possible, and steroidogenesis inhibitors or radiotherapy with steroidogenesis inhibitors, pituitary directed medical treatment, or combination of all the above, or we can use neurotic or receptor antagonist, or we can do is bilateral adrenal. Now, coming to the end of the discussion, almost uh, medical treatment for cushion syndrome, metyrapol inhibits 11 beta hydroxylase. Guideline we have discussed uh, during the steroidal genesis 11 beta hydroxylase with the goal of lowering cortisol concentration, often before definitive therapy or while awaiting benefit from the pituitary irradiation. The daily doses must be determined by measurements of plasma or urinary free cortisol levels. Our aim is to achieve a mean plasma con cortisol concentration of about 300 nanomole per liter. The drug is usually given in doses ranging from 250 mg twice daily to 1.5 gram every 6 hours. This is the maximum dose every 6 hours with the lower doses for adrenal adenoma and higher for ectopic ACTH. And overall is effective in around 50% of all patients. Nausea is a side effect that can be helped by giving the drug with milk if it is not caused by adrenal insufficiency. If we suppress the adrenal gland too much, then also nausea can be a symptom. But if it is not the cause, then we can avoid the symptom by administering it with milk. It ranges from 250 mg daily to 1.5 grams QID, the dose of metaraprone, which inhibits 11 beta hydroxylase. To achieve a plasma cortisol level of around 300 ml per liter. Ketoconazole uh, blocks a variety of steroidogenic cytokine P450 dependent enzymes, not specific but variety of the enzymes, which lowers the plasma cortisol levels. 
for effective control of Cushion syndrome, 400 to 1600 milligram daily has been required, and an acidic stomach is needed for absorption. Drug is effective in around 60 percent of patients. So, administering it with the PPI ketoconazole will turn the drug ineffective. Another drug is mutotin. It is an adrenalytic drug that is taken up by both normal and malignant adrenal tissue, causing adrenal atrophy and necrosis. Because of its toxicity, it has been used mainly in management of adrenal particle carcinoma. Doses of up to 5 grams per day are required to control blood corticoid excess. Although the evidence that the drug causes tumor shrinkage or improves long term survival is lacking, but is a part of therapy in the patients with the adrenal cortical carcinomas. These three drugs are mainly used: metaraphan, ketoconazole, and metoprolol. Rest is, uh, if it is a pituitary adenoma, go for transthyroidal surgery. Uh, adrenal glands are responsible for. Uh, Cushion syndrome, then if possible, remove the adrenal glands. That's it.